Hey guys, Sundown here. This is going to be my chapter of YouTube. No, not to know ties out of the seven deadly sins, 294, hope, discord, and despair. Good chapter. I really enjoyed it. I mean, there were, there, there's an issue I have with Taizai in general, which we'll get to. Uh, but nonetheless, a really good chapter, which was quite dope. And leaves room for discussion. So first, we see Mile use a, a technique called Invitation of Reincarnation, which is an ability which allows him to send a soul into reincarnation with its memories intact once reincarnated. So once this soul has been reincarnated, their memories of their past life will be intact and they'll they'll remember all of that stuff so why the reason he does this is he, he does it with the intention of should derrieri or oslo come back in uh, well when they come back into the real world and they uh, wish to if they wish to exact revenge on him they will have the option to do so due to their remembering due to their memory of maya so they will have that option sh uh, when they come back to life. And um, I was like, yeah, that's that's cool. You know, they, they'll come back. They probably won't be strong enough to do anything to him. But they'll be back to possibly do something to him if they so wish. Which they probably won't because they most likely won't give a shit. They're alive is what, is what will matter. Unless we're talking about Deri Yeti who prob probably doesn't want to come back to life without Monspeed. So it's a little bit of a shit show for her. I mean, like, he didn't really ask whether she wanted to come back, and she didn't, I don't think at that point in time, she'd want to come back. You know, she'd be with Monspeed wherever they are. That'd be good times for her, and then for her to get pulled back into the real world, that would be major kind of fuckeries. <clears throat> so Galtha then tells uh, Mile that he too will accept this punishment, you know, so they can hold hands into this punishment, and, you know, whatever. I don't really care about that. So he then asks, uh, Mile then asks Gal. Yeah, no, sorry. Gauth then asks Mile to come with him to Camelot, to come with them to Camelot so they can finish off this OD original demon dude. And Mile asks how he could possibly join the battle uh, when he single handedly killed two of his brothers, and uh, they were two of the Archangels. And he has essentially emotionally scarred both his brother and Elizabeth through what he's done and through his so called death. And it's not so much that he doesn't want to help, I don't think. He just feels that he's lost his place amongst amongst both societies, especially amongst the goddesses, which is where he belongs. But he's, I mean, like, consider it, he's, he's been on both sides of the war. And on one side, he fought for the goddesses and fought without really thinking about any consequences of the demons he was killing, whether they were innocent or whether they needed to be killed. And he never put any thought behind his brother's words, which was, we were cleansing these guys' souls. And now he understands that actually these guys had emotions too. These guys were co uh, cogniz uh, cognizant? Cogn I don't even know what the word is. Uh, they were they were human enough, they were sentient enough that they they were they recognized that they had societies societies and stuff like that they had emotions and all of that good stuff and it's the reason why mile got in the position he was in in the first place because he decided to kill og galtha's wife and he was like nah that's it your memories are mine so that's why that's why i feel like he, he doesn't feel like he he really belongs there and then alongside the demons he doesn't really belong anyway because he's my L. but he also massacred his own people as one of the demons and feels guilty big time about that. Elizabeth, 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 <laughs> Elizabeth then changes his mind real quick, saying she wants him to help, not for the demons or for the goddesses. She's like, screw all that shit. It doesn't matter where we're from or who we are. What matters is that we can bring an end to this holy war. So he's like, I, I, I can roll with that. And I'm like, yeah, you should roll with that because you, you're going to be pivotal, I think, to the final battle. Meanwhile, King motions his fingers kind of just like, in some sort of Illuminati sign and causes a tree to grow while he and his company kind of worry over the fates of both Escanor and Merlin having sensed the original demon coming to life. And the leaves of this tree swirl around King, cladding him in an old school French looking French looking suit, making him look fire as shit like fire as hell. He's got this like hanky thing hanging off of the front, you know, like that puffy, frilly thing. I'm not even sure what it's called. Someone, met, I think Griever mentions it in the podcast. Go watch the boar's hat. Griever mentions it in there. And go check out his videos behind the bar. Always good. Um, but he mentions what it's called. I forgot what it's called. But, uh, but King is like in a black blazer, black pants. Uh, he's got a white shirt with white brogues. He's looking clean as hell. He's looking clean, especially with his haircut as well. Looking clean. So... I'm like, yo, King, like, you look cool as shit, but you're going to war. You're going to fight the, like, the most powerful 
entity we've seen so far and you're dressed like that it's like come on at least at least armor up a bit i mean i know you're op judging by the end of this um chapter but y you know clad up a bit you gotta dress according to the situation my dude so Diane instantly starts imagining having kids with the guy and then realizes King doesn't have chastity or fall. She's like, yo, where's, where's chastity or fall at? So while this is going on, Elizabeth and company return with Mael, much to the surprise of Diane. She was like, oh, okay, I can't see Mael. And he's just there behind her with his triceps bulging out like he's been freaking skull crushing for days. And while that's going on, Escanor and Merlin are, ha Merlin are having a real hard time of fighting against the original demon. Uh, even though the translation translation suggests that Escanor is in his one form, it's it's at high noon or something like that. That's not right. I mean, like just look at look at Escanor. He's definitely not in his the one the one form, and um, he he gets wounded across the chest. And you can tell because like he even though he's got that fur lining across his neck, it's not. When he, when he assumes the one form, it's like Luffy with that steam. When he assumes the one form, he gets like this flame lining around his, like, from his chest. It's like a flame scarf, and that, I don't think that was there. I think here, he, even though it looks fiery, I think it's just his fur coat thing that he was wearing. That's that's the scarf he, around his neck. But usually he gets this, like, flaming scarf around his uh, around his neck and his shoulders. And his, his eyes, the iris, is usually... Uh, set of flame as well. You can see his eyes and look kind of like they've leaked out of their their container. So that's that's another way of seeing that he isn't in actual fact the one, and also he isn't large enough to be the one. When he's the one, he's absolutely humongous. So I doubt he was in his the one form. Is what I'm trying to get across. So wounded it across his chest. Eskinor's like, I right, I'm gonna throw my cruel son, and he he throws this at the original demon who actually blocks it. Uh, with his shield finally coming in handy, and he doesn't—he doesn't even seem so so fussed about blocking it. So I'm like, yo, shit! The original demon is actually really strong. Good thing. Merlin gets bit slapped by a mouth beam from the original demon, which gave me a reason to be happy. I was like, yes, thank God. I mean, like Merlin could have just been like, oh yeah, I set up loads of traps, and you know, uh, the, 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 your weakness will constantly bombard you and shit like that. And I'm like, nah, that's bullshit. So finally, she gets bit slapped, and this angers Eskino obviously, and he just gets some horse hooves to the face really knocking his teeth out i was like yo shit but the key here is while he's kind of been knocked into the air the original demon turns around and is ready he prepare he like picks up both of his swords of darkness and he's literally about to slice Escanor in two and i was like oh shit but then he diverts his attention the original demon diverts his attention to something that's coming in he's like yo what the hell is that coming in into camelot right now it's coming in real fast real strong i have no idea what it is so he diverts his attention. Before that, I want y'all to realize something here. Escanor was about to get cut into our boy Escanor, strongest guy we've seen so far. And he's, he's like never been hurt for a long period of time, unless, you know, after his fight with Meliodas, you want to count that as being hurt. Because he was hurt after that. He was coughing up blood and he wasn't quite right. And he hasn't been quite right since then. But um, uh, the strongest guy we've seen so far, just in his the one form and in terms of his his pride and stuff like that he was about to get cut in two for jokes and was saved by the next part so the original demon is no joke suddenly out of nowhere chastity of fall comes in and absolutely like almost pierces through the original demon who's saved by his shield and his quick reflexes and it slams straight into the original demon shield bloodying up his mouth and saving Escanor's life with this king and his squad rush towards camelot getting ready for the next fight and my issue with the chapter here is, and what I assume some of you will agree with and some of you won't, is the power skating. Now, I know King has been set up since the beginning to be, to like, to become the most powerful fairy king in existence. But before him, you assume the most powerful fairy king was Gloxinia, and he could, like, he was strong, but he was never this strong. I mean, King is now the strongest, but you'd assume that would mean, oh, he'd be, he'd be stronger than Gloxinia, which he is. But he is leagues above Gloxinia. Like, once his wings came out, he's, like, absolutely next level. He demolished Amael with, like, four commandments. And now he's he's straight away... This guy, the original demon, is above Mael with uh, four commandments. And he just straight away bloodies his mouth. No joke. Easy. Without even a struggle. This was, like, just a, a flick of the wrist for King. So what I'm saying is this King is incredibly OP here. Because the original demon... I don't give a shit what y'all say. The original demon is... Uh, a fusion of uh, Kusak and Chandler, two demons who, uh, who the original entity, the original demon, fought against the Demon King. You know, this is like shit. But then the reverse of that is the Demon King is OP as shit. So shouldn't it be 
fair for kind of in this universe for the fairy king to be just as OP, which would be um, king. And I have no argument against that. Why shouldn't the fairy king be as strong as the demon king or the or the queen of the goddesses or something like that, the supreme deity or the or the or the leader of the giant clan or some shit like that? There is no reason other than uh, I don't have a reason. So. In that sense, King should be as strong as he could possibly be, possibly able to fight maybe the Demon King. So, But the only issue here is that the Demon King has, has had a lot more time to gain his power, to train for probably stronger individuals and things like that. So he should be more experienced and through his experience, stronger than King. Um, but yeah, the, the original Demon gets bloodied up. So I'm not too sure how I feel about that. But at this point in time, I'm just like, King's power level is like really high. Escanor is kind of like he's dropping down ever since his fight with Meliodas. Merlin is just kind of this inconsistent wrench in the plans. She'll like, she'll be important against Kusak and Chandler, and then just oh we need them to fuse. Let's get ahead to demolish them, and then they'll fuse. That was bullshit. Kusak and Chandler should have destroyed Merlin for jokes, and then I won't come back to that. That's gonna be that's just gonna get me raging. So let me know what you guys saw this chapter. Let me know what you guys saw this review. Like, comment, subscribe, all of that good stuff, and I'll see you guys in a bit.